Well, good morning. Morning. Welcome to everybody here. Welcome to all those of you watching at home. Um, great to have you with us as well. We've got some music coming through our ears, don't we? I'm not quite sure what music that is. There's a bit of reverb on your channel, I think. Oh, wonderful. Um, great. Great to have you here. My name is Matt. I'm one of the leaders here at Hope Community Church. Um, and um, yesterday, a bunch of blokes were here all day, singing their hearts out, hearing from God's word, encouraging one another. It was the release men's conference. Uh, and if you were there and you had a great time, can you have a very randy roar? Yeah. Very good. Okay. Uh, and what we want to start off today is um, I want to hear how God blessed you through release yesterday. And so we're going to give it a bit of space for that. Uh, I'm going to keep talking for about 30 seconds more just to give you time to think. If you're a man and you are here, um, what was God speaking to you about? How did he encourage? Just come share and encourage us. Um, we're going to get some new microphone, uh, some new batteries in that microphone. It's so smooth here at Hope Community Church. Um, and then Nick is going to have the microphone there. And so if you want to share what God was speaking to you about, how God blessed you yesterday through release... The microphone is yours. Who's going to... Actually, let's not say who's going to be first. Let's just get first one out of the way. Who's going to be second? Okay, first one's done. Who's going to be second? Share about release yesterday. Richard, come on up. Morning, all. Um, well, I was just totally blessed to be here and worshipping with all the guys. But the bit I want to share is I brought my son-in-law, who isn't a Christian. And I spoke to my daughter this morning. She said, are you coming up later? Because he hasn't shut up since he got home. So, um, please think on me and pray because I think I'm going to have a lot of questions this afternoon. I know you are. Uh, get your fit, mate. Um, so, this was my first year at release. Um, and I got dragged into the organizing committee, and it was just like, okay, fine. And then I came, and I've never experienced anything like it. Men singing in a room is quite powerful. Men praying together, even more powerful. And it's just, just a great, great event. So I'll definitely be signing up for next year. I'll probably be on the organizing committee next year. So, yeah, and I could just encourage any man who didn't come to kind of get the date in their diary and to come. What is the date, Nick? 4th of February, 2023. Great. Thanks, Jason. <laughs> For those that didn't come, Graham Kendrick, Nathan Blackaby, and Matt Mack. Morning, all. Just uh, want to share, I had a message um, this morning from a guy called Israel Silgram, who spoke yesterday. Uh, he shared his testimony with us. And, uh, and I just sent him a little message to say thank you last night. And uh, I got this off him this morning, which I'll share with you. He said, it was great to be there. Thank you for having me. What you're doing through your church is just incredible. Um, I've heard so many people testifying to the impact that you're having on their lives. He's talking about the collective too. Um, a life of purpose. And thank you for your encouragement. And see you soon. Sorry, I got one. Michael? Mate. I got one, mate. And so I was, I was blown away by the response, really. So um, this, if you're part of our Facebook page, then you, you um, might see some of the pictures that have been posted there. Uh, but there were two opportunities for us all to respond. There was splitting into different groups to pray in different areas of the hall for things that God was putting on your heart. And then there was also an opportunity to do business with God about clearing out rubbish and moving on with him and chucking stuff in a bin by the foot of the cross, which was over there. Um, and actually, the vast majority of people took part in both of those things. And it's, I think it's really a challenge to respond anyway in any, any environment. Um, but also, as a group of blokes, I think it's also quite hard. It takes a vulnerability 
um, and uh, a determination to mean business with God. Um, and that's what was happening, because actually we're all on a journey and we've all got, God wants to be doing stuff in all of us all of the time. And there was just a, an openness to God yesterday, which was really wonderful. And I'd echo that. One of the prayers in the week was that there would be no holding back and, and men would get straight into it. And the cue to put stuff in the bin was snaking up there. And they were, as soon as Matt sort of like gave that call to do that, the guys were up and had already written some stuff down. And uh, it just shows what things there are that we all need to get rid of that are. They're not even at the back. They're not here. They're here because they were straight up and putting stuff in the bin. I'm just going to ask Rebecca just to say a few words because it was her first time. She honoured us with, with singing and um, she said something to me kind of at the end, but I'll, I'll leave it to Rebecca to explain. Yeah, so as Nick said, I had the privilege of being at release yesterday and singing in the band with the guys here and um, all throughout the worship, the, even when I wasn't singing, there was just an overwhelming sense of the presence of the spirit in with us and there were people that there were people dancing it was such a, a joyous moment in which we got to glorify god for all that he is and it was a time that i'm never going to forget and i hope that every single person who was there will never forget it either and rebecca did fantastic Go on, Ayadeli. No, okay, me. <laughs> Will you stand if you're able? We're going to spend some time singing, but I want to read some words. We were focusing on the resurrection of Jesus yesterday, and I want to read some words from 1 Corinthians. If Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, <clears throat> your faith is futile, and you're still in your sins. And those who've fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we're of all people most to be pitied. So if the resurrection didn't happen, the whole thing's pointless. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. All will be made alive. And so, Father, we come, we celebrate the resurrection life we have in Jesus this morning. Let's sing, church. When all I see is the battle. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. Yes, it I. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, so when I'll fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you, and every fear I'll lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night, oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, God, you see the beauty. When I see the cross, when all I see is a cross, God, you see the empty 
to So when I'll fight, I'll fight on my knees With my hands lifted I Oh God, the battle belongs to you And every fear I'll lay at your feet I'll sing through the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows and you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. An almighty fortress, yeah, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against Let's come to our almighty fortress. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I'll fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you and every fear. sing through the night oh god the battle belongs to you hey oh god the battle belongs to you the battle belongs to you Lord. and if you are for me who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. When all I see is a cross, God, you see the empty tomb. Yes, you see the empty tomb. Father, thank you that the cross isn't the end of the story. And because of the resurrection, we have hope for this life and for the next. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. <clears throat> In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through your darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my living hope Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to where my sin and bear my shame. 
The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ is my living oh. And hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain, there's salvation is. grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living oh then came the morning that sealed the promise your very body began to breathe out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe out of the broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hallelujah hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah hallelujah death has lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living, oh, Jesus Christ, my living hope, oh, God, you are my you for who you are. We're going to carry on worshiping, but why don't a couple of leaders out in prayer? Nice and loud so everyone can hear. Just prayers of thanksgiving for who Jesus is, what he's done for us. Go on, church, let's pray. value them being here with us what a blessing it is what an incredible atmosphere this morning to have our young folks in isn't it yes. wonderful to have them here and the scripture says remember your creator in the days of your youth and that's what we pray for our children 
that they would come to know Jesus. We've sung how the battle belongs to the God, and we've proved that as we've gone through life. And we want our children and young folks to prove that as well. And Matt, I'm thank you for the opportunity to pray because I just felt so strongly the Lord was saying to me, Ian, you've got to pray for the children. I want to pray for them now. Father, come. we thank you for yes, the Lord. children and the young folks that are with us here this morning. And Lord, our prayer for them is that they will grow up to know and love Jesus. Yes, Lord, come. We thank you that we have such a wonderful story to tell them, to tell them of a Savior who loves them, who cares for them, who gave his life for them, who died for them, who shed his blood for them, and who is raised on high to serve them throughout their lives. And, oh, God and Father, I just cry to you for our children amongst us this morning, our grandchildren, our children. Lord, I pray that you will protect them. I pray that you will keep them safe. And I pray, Lord, that they will come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. For he made us a way by which we have been saved. He's the Savior of the world. So we lift up a shout for his fame and renown. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Jesus, Savior of the world. God so loved that he gave his son. God so loved that he gave his son to lay down his life for the sake of us. He bore the way of our sin and shame with a cry. It is finished. The Lord overcame the darkness. He's alive. Death has been defeated. For he made us a way by which we have been saved. He's the Savior of the world. So we lift up a shout. For his fame and renown. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, Jesus, Savior of the world. So we go out and spread the word. We must spread the word of his soon return to reclaim the world. For his glory, let the church now sing of his coming King, crowned with majesty, our Redeemer, and he reigns, ruler of the heavens, and his name is Jesus the Messiah, for he made us a way by which we have been saved. He's the Savior of the world. So we lift up a shout for his fame and renown. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, Jesus, Savior of the world. You are worthy of our praise. There is no one like our God. Christ the Lord, 
Christ the Lord overcame the darkness. He's alive. Death has been defeated. And he reigns, ruler of the heavens. And his name is, let's declare, Christ the Lord overcame the darkness. Christ the Lord overcame the darkness. He's alive. Death has been defeated. And he reigns, ruler of the heavens. And his name is Jesus the Messiah. For he made us a way by which we have been saved. He's the Savior of the world. So we lift up a shout for his fame and renown. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, Jesus, for he made a way. For he made us a way by which we have been saved. He's the Savior of the world. So we lift up a shout for his fame and renown. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, Jesus, Savior of the world. You are the Savior of the world. Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you came to do. And we worship you, our risen and resurrected King, this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Guys, please take your seats. And our friend Sean's going to come up and give the small talk. Hello. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. How's everyone? Good. Um, so I was taking a walk on Friday in town, and there's a few important things when you take a walk in town. And I dropped a piece of rubbish on the floor. What do I need to do? Yes, yeah, so I, went, I went down to pick it up. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I went down to pick it up, and then a gust of wind took it. And it was rather like I had running across the front of here. It was, it was gone. So I chased it a little bit. And I was chasing it. I was really focused on doing the right thing, picking up this piece of rubbish. And it went into the road. And I stepped into the road. And then I realized, wait a minute. There's something that's more important than picking up this rubbish right now. I need to focus on the road. And I almost ran right into the road, which wouldn't be sensible, would it? Thank you. <laughs> um, so I came to my senses. I refocused on the road. I got the pram which I'd left back there. <laughs> I crossed over the road safely and I went and I picked up the piece of rubbish. Because when you're out walking in town, the most important thing to focus on and not forget about is the traffic. Now, this is a bit like in life. There's, there's lots of good and important things you can do. You can work hard on your hobbies and your sports. You can be kind and caring to people. You can do your schoolwork. These are all good things, but you need to make sure that you're focused on God because that's the most important thing. Just like the traffic is the most important thing when you're walking in town, God is the most important thing in life. Now, this is an excuse not to do your homework because I managed to cross the road and get the rubbish, but you've got to focus on God first. And yeah, I just wanted to remind everyone of that today. Thank you. We're going to sing again. Song with actions. Why do you stand if you're able? Very simple actions, but reminding us about how we put God first. We put Jesus first. There's no one. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. 
There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like him. Come on. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. Well, there's no one, there's no one like I walk, I walk, I walk here and there. I search, I search hey, here and there. I turn around here and there. But there's no one, there's no one like, oh, there's no one, there's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like, I walk, I walk, I walk, here and there, I search, I search. Here and there, I turn around here and there, but there's no one, there's no one like him. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like him. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like him. There's no one, there's no one like him. There's no one, there's no one like him. Oh man, do you have a seat? Excellent. Good morning, everyone. Oh my goodness, it's so lovely to see all of you. And I think there's probably um, some visitors here, or if you're new here, um, you're really welcome. Please make yourself known to us. There's tea and coffee after. Um, yeah, lovely to have you here. So I've got, I'm Kathy, part of the leadership team here, and I have some family news. So we've got, you should have a new sheet, or it might come on the email, um, but we have the Shepherd's Pie Club, which is on the 16th of Feb, and it's a hot lunch for, um, open to all families, and it's, at, it's actually Knighton Church, and I'm sure Sally's here. Sally, give me a wave. She's over there. So if you're interested in coming, um, I think there's quite a lot of people, but a few more are always welcome. Um, Every Tuesday morning, we have our early risers prayer meeting, which is thankfully on Zoom, so you, don't, you can come in your pajamas. Um, it's six to seven. We'd love to see you there. The codes should be in the newsletter as well. Um, got, so as part of a church, we, um, many of us regularly give to the church, and we can do that by standing order. And if that's something you'd like to do, but you don't know how to, um, just um, email admin and they'll let you know but if you don't want to do that and you just want to give a different way there should be a box I'm just like is it there yeah it is there's a box as you leave as well um, okay I've got this is sort of notices and family news and um, we do have some slightly sad family news we've got um, so Hannah oh as Hannah and Pete and um, Hannah's mom Sue sadly passed away yesterday um, and so our thoughts are with her and the family and with Dave, Pete, Emily, James and the rest of the family. So um, she, Sue loved, loved the Lord. So, you know, it's a time of sadness, but we know um, where she is. So I'm just going to pray now for her before the children go out. Father, thank you that we are family. And Lord, thank you that we have a hope that is in you. And I just lift that whole family to you now and ask that you would give them peace um, in this time of sadness and grieving, Lord. And may they know the love of their, not only their family, but their church family around them and you. Amen. So it's time for our children and young people. I think young people are saying in, but children certainly to leave. If you're not quite sure where to go, head to that direction and somebody will direct you. Okay.
Welcome back, if you've dropped your little ones off and come back. Um, I'd like to invite, can I invite Jemima up, please? One of our members. Woo! Woo. Yep, feel free to give her. <laughs> we always love to embarrass people as they come on stage. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Jemima, I was just going to, I know that you, have, you work with students, and there's something quite exciting happening in the next couple of weeks. Um, so do you want to tell me a little bit about it? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, so this coming week is Leicester and DMU Christian Unions Joint Events Week. And if you don't know what Christian Unions are, they are student-led mission teams on universities. Um, so their events week is kind of the peak of the year. All the training and encouragement has really been building up to next week. And we're hosting events daily. We're going onto campus every single day to chat to people. And it is our prayer and our faith that God will bring people into his kingdom next week. Um, yeah, so that's what's happening. It's very exciting. Excellent. Um, very exciting. How can we pray for you and pray for anything in particular we can pray for so it's kind of an in joke in christian union circles that when it's events week the enemy shows up big time and it's sort of like anything that could go wrong will probably go wrong but god will have his way anyway um, so <laughs> we've seen that a little bit already. Uh, one of the main students who was organizing this week came down with glandular fever last week. Um, so <laughs> the enemy really doesn't want us to be sharing the gospel on campus. So please really do pray for protection for myself and the students um, and for God's word to prevail and go out and save regardless. Um, a particular prayer point is... The evening venue that we've got our evening events in has said we've got a maximum capacity of 60 people. Uh, yeah, and they kind of came and told us that last minute, so we can't really go anywhere else. But yeah, just pray that, I don't know, the clicker would miraculously break and 100 people would be counted as 60. I don't know, but yeah, <laughs> please be praying for that. Thanks. And before you disappear, um, so exciting stuff, but I also know that you've got some exciting stuff going on. Personally, sorry. And I just thought, um, again, just share a little bit about what's happening in the next couple of months with you, and we'll pray. You don't have to do share too much. <laughs> okay, I won't share too much. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so for those of you who may not know, I got engaged last year. So, <laughs> um, so I'm sadly going to be moving up to Loughborough. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, before the summer to live and be married to James, who works at a church in Loughborough. So he can't really leave his church. He literally works for them. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's that really. <laughs> Too many booze. No, we're very, we are sad. We will be, obviously, we, we will pray for you later on anyway. But um, can I pray for you now? Pray for the things. Okay. Father God, I just thank you for the work that um, student unions do and Christian unions do within universities. And it's such an important time. Lord, I just pray for the next week. So, Lord, your protection over everything. Lord, I just pray that people would come to know you um, through the work that's happened. Lord, I thank you. Um, yeah, I thank you for everyone that's involved in that. Amen. Amen. Um, I forgot to say earlier, I've got a WhatsApp group for immediate and urgent prayer requests throughout the week. So if you'd like to receive those and be praying real time as stuff unfolds, then do come and chat to me after the service and I'll add you. Thanks. Fab. And we'll definitely be praying on the Tuesday morning, early morning prayer that will be on air. Cowl, because I'll forget, but. Right, it's time to welcome up um, Phil Edwards, who's going to bring the word. Well, good morning. My name's Phil. Um, I'm a member here and an ex-leader and uh, ex-lots of things, actually. Ex-worker. I'm retired now. I think we should... Um, 
if you're a rugby follower, then you know we should pray for Ian and, uh, and don't speak to the mayors. Is that okay? All right. <laughs> Perhaps pray for Steve as well, actually, because, uh, yeah, a lot of sadness today. Right. Let's go for it. What makes you angry? Anything? Now, if I were to ask Lynn that about me, she would definitely say, my nemesis is IT. I love IT, but I like IT to work properly. And she will tell you that when IT doesn't work as it should, I get a bit mad. And also when websites are so poorly designed you can't find anything, I get a bit mad. But I've never, ever got quite as mad as this. Can you show the video? Bad day at work. So I don't think I've ever got quite that angry with IT. But what does make you angry? Well, they asked this question of, of general population and uh, they came up with some of these things. People who turn left but almost stop before they do is top one. We all can em empathize with that, I'm sure. Going along and trying to find a parking space and you spot one and when you get there, there's a motorbike. Yeah? Who's got the remote? I want the controller remote. Give it to me. Other people's eating habits. Don't eat with your mouth full. Don't chomp. Buffering when you're watching a film. Right at the exciting bit. Right at the cliffhanger. Oh, referees. Oh, gosh. Vardy, don't mention Peter Vardy, by the way, today. Oh, <laughs> that's something that makes me a bit angry sometimes. It's usually my fault for not topping it up. And people who litter. Sean. Yeah, Sean. <laughs> Quite right. And people who drive crazily. Mad driving makes you mad as well. And people who don't park correctly, like this morning in the car park, I couldn't park in the space because someone had taken up two. These are the things that people put that make them really angry. There are four, really, four categories of getting angry. There's the first one, which is the inconsequential things, most of those things on there, where actually after you get angry, you get all embarrassed, you're embarrassed about your response, you regret you've gone off the deep end, you, you think, oh gosh, I shouldn't have done that, it doesn't sit right with you. Second category is probably where you feel like you've got a bit of the moral high ground. Therefore, that person's breaking the law. Therefore, you're allowed to be angry. So if someone's littering, you have a right to be angry. But actually, we have to be careful we don't become a grumpy old man. Then there's the third category where you're angry at yourself. We all get angry at ourselves, but usually it's due to lies, complete, utter lies. You know, you believe those lies. Why am I so useless? Why can't I do this? Why do things always go wrong? Why am I so inadequate? Why am I a failure? Lies, lies, lies. Don't get angry with yourself. And the fourth one is the righteous anger. This is the legitimate anger 
So it might be about abuse or violence or hypocrisy or corruption or, or maybe um, injustice of some sort. So you might get angry at what's happening in Myanmar when you watch the news or what's happening in Hong Kong. You might get angry at the treatment of the Uyghur Muslims or the, you know, the illegal uh, building in Palestine or Afghanistan. And that sort of anger comes from the heart. It comes from the heart because it's not anger for anger's sake. It's because someone is suffering and someone is suffering because of injustice. Now I want to read a story where Jesus gets angry. In John chapter 2, I'm going to read from verse 13 to 30, 25. It's on the screen. When the Jewish Passover was near, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and money changers seated at their tables. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those selling doves, he said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a marketplace? His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. On account of this, the Jews demanded, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do these things? Jesus answered, destroy the temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. This temple took 46 years to build, the Jews replied. Are you going to raise it up in three days? But Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And then they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. I was wondering about a title for this talk. The Bible normally says Jesus cleanses the temple, but I don't think that's the total story. I wanted to call it um, when Jesus lost it. But actually, Matt's title is better, The Meeting Place. So let's use that. I can't use when Jesus lost it. Why? Because Jesus never lost control. He never had a hissy fit or a tantrum or lose his temper, blow his temper or blow his top. He didn't fly off the handle or regret any actions he did. Anger didn't control Jesus. Jesus controlled his anger. And Jesus' anger never led to bitterness. His response was always, always proportionate. In fact, Jesus is full of the Spirit, so of course, what's he going to be full of? The fruit of the Spirit, you know, the love, joy, peace, patience, uh, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, gentleness, and of course, self-control. Jesus had self-control. And when he said the Son can do nothing by himself, he can only do what he sees his Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son does also, we have to conclude in this story, in this picture we have here, we have to conclude that Jesus is actually demonstrating the anger of God. The wrath of God, if you want to call it that. This was righteous anger. This was righteous anger due to injustice and because someone was suffering because they'd been forgotten. We'll come to that. But this anger was coming from the heart of the Father. It wasn't coming out of frustration. It wasn't coming because of impatience, like our anger does so often. Jesus gets angry, and when he gets angry, we have to take notice. Because Jesus is the only person who can truly stand on the moral high ground. Isn't he? So you say, well, okay, that's good, but what relevance has this got to do with me? What, where's the challenge that I'm going to receive today? What's the thing that I'm going to do differently tomorrow than I do today because of this sermon? Well, we're going to get there. Because we don't listen just because we want understanding and knowledge, do we? We listen because we want to change our lives. We want application, something we can put practically into life. So when we look at this story, we start off with the understanding because we have to say, or I have to say, well, Houston, we have a problem. You see, you'll find Jesus doing this in the temple in Matthew, you'll find it in Mark, find it in Luke, find it in John, all four Gospels. So we've really got to listen. It must be really important. The trouble is, in Matthew and Mark and Luke, it happens right at the end of Jesus' ministry 
after he's ridden in on the donkey and everyone's crying, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. And in John, John puts it right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. So we have two options here. We can say Jesus did it twice, maybe. Or we can say, well, because John liked to put things thematically and not chronologically, maybe he just inserted this story in here because he wanted to make a point and the theme he was trying to bring out, that's acceptable as well. But regardless of which one we take, I'm going to take all four together because the meaning of what Jesus was doing is the same. What was Jesus angry about? We start with the Passover. It's Passover. Jerusalem and Passover would swell to four to five times the normal population of the city. Crazy. Maybe 200,000, even a million. Josephus, a Jewish historian, even said three million. There would be chaos and there would be business opportunities. So, in the, in the, the court of the uh, temple... There was the ox, there were the oxen, and there were the lambs and the goats and the turtle doves and all the pigeons, for those who couldn't afford lambs, all being sold off. But Jesus wasn't angry just because people were selling the animals for the sacrifice. That was all legit. It had been going on for centuries. People had traveled miles and miles to come to Passover, and they couldn't bring their own sheep practically, or if they did, and a wolf got in and nipped his ear on the way, it, would, it wouldn't be good enough for the sacrifice. And they couldn't bring their own pigeons and turtle doves because they would probably die on the way. So they got there to Jerusalem and bought them when they were there. This is all legit. So what was Jesus angry about? He wasn't actually angry about money being exchanged either. Because we had to, they had to change their money. Because they, the temple would not would not have Roman coins or Greek coins or the Syrian coins that all had the heads on them. Instead, you had to have that top one, the shekel. In fact, it was the half shekel. That was the temple tax, a half shekel. So changing money had been going on for centuries as well, and that was legit as well. So what is Jesus angry about? Well... Jesus did say in verse 16 of John 2, how dare you turn my father's house into a market? So it's not the actions that are happening, it's where it's taking place and the fact that no one cared about the impact. Of course, Jesus was also angry about extortion because people were being ripped off, there's no doubt about that. It's a captive market. This is the dark side of capitalism, isn't it? You know, a bit like um, petrol prices on the motorway. <laughs> Don't buy your petrol on the motorway. A bit like printer ink. You buy printer ink and it's more expensive than the printer with ink in it that you bought in the first place. They're ripping you off, aren't they? Well, maybe. Water, bottle of water in the airport. Beer in a club in Ibiza. I don't know why I put that. I've never been to Ibiza, but I'm not sure I've ever been in a nightclub to come to that. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, the vendors, the vendors were making a fortune, and they were making a fortune out of a celebration of freedom from slavery. That wasn't pretty, but more importantly. They were fleecing the outsiders and the visitors all flooding in from all parts of the world, coming in to Jerusalem. They were taking advantage of these people instead of doing what God had told them to do, which is to always offer hospitality and friendship. And no one cares about the impact. That's Jesus' point. And if he quotes Jeremiah 7, you'll find that in, in the Matthew and the Luke account. He, said, he quotes, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. But you know something, if you, if you go into Jeremiah 7 and you read the whole passage, you will see why Jesus is quoting it. Because it's all about the oppression of the foreigner, the oppression of the fatherless, the oppression of the widow. And the Bible often talks about those three together, foreigner, the, the orphan, and the widow. 
What it means is anyone who's in need, anyone who's in need of hospitality, anyone who's in need because they're poor. And the, the passage is all about that. And Jesus is saying they're being ignored. You have made the temple your hideout, is what that passage says. Do you think I can't see you, says God in that passage? I will remove my presence from you. So it's a pretty angry passage, that Jeremiah 7, and Jesus is picking it up. But the nub of Jesus' anger is coming from the heart of God for the outsider. They should have made to feel they belong, but instead they're being ignored. The lost, the fatherless, and the social outsiders, they're being totally ignored. And Jesus said this, he quoted this time from Isaiah 56, which you'll find in the Mark and Luke account. My house will be a house of prayer for all people, for all nations, Jesus quoted. Foreigners should be welcome. And if you read that passage in Isaiah 56, you will find it said. Let no outsider say, I am excluded from the temple, it says. That was Jesus' anger. The outsider was being excluded from what was the court of the Gentiles, the only part of the temple they were allowed in. This was the court for all the non-Jews and also for Jews who were considered ritually unclean, you know, and that's a can of worms. Oh, actually, the can of worms wasn't allowed in either, but that's by the way. The court of the Gentiles is the house of prayer for all people that Jesus just quoted from Isaiah. It was unpoliced, open to everyone. It was, it was instructed by God that it's got to be there, that, the, that we sh there should be a place for the outsider. But they couldn't get too close. They could only get into into the court of the Gentiles, the non-Jew, because they were faced, when they tried to go any further, they were faced with this sign, which interpreted says, I'll have to read it up here because the beam's in the way. You can read it. No foreigner is to go beyond the balustrade and the plaza of the temple zone. Whoever is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his death, which will follow. A bit ambiguous, isn't it? <laughs> That's what they got. So they, but they were allowed this huge area called the Court of the Gentiles to go and worship, even if they were an outsider. But they couldn't get close. Some had come to worship the God of Israel, even though they weren't Israelites. Some had God come just to, just to look at the temple and, and to try and understand who this God is, but they couldn't get close. There was a busyness, there was a, a lot of noise, there was a focus on the rituals in the Jewish bit. Instead of an inclusion for everyone, there was an exclusion. Instead of accessibility, there was no room to move. Instead of an atmosphere conducive to worship and prayer and contemplation, there was a total hullabaloo. And they had forgotten God's heart for the outsider. That's why Jesus was angry. Okay, what about the application? What does that mean to you and me? Let's try and get something out of this that's practical that we can put into practice tomorrow, shall we? Verse 19 says this. Jesus said, destroy this temple and I'll raise it again in three days. And of course... All the officials of the temple and the priests all said, what? It took 46 years to build. How are you going to build it in three days? And what did he say? The temple he spoke of was his own body. See, the era of bricks and mortar as a temple for the presence of God to live in had ended. The temple was going to transfer into Jesus' body. Jesus full of the Holy Spirit, the perfect human, and God. The temple was going to transfer to Jesus' body. And when he died on the cross, of course, we know that that curtain that separated the Holy of Holies, that place that the high priest could only go in once a year and no one else could go for fear of death, 
That curtain split from top to bottom. It was three meters tall. It weighed tons. It was full of fine linen, blue, purple, scarlet yarn. It was embroidered with a cherubim, ripped from top to bottom in Jesus' death. Because Jesus wanted to say the way into the holy presence of God is open to all. No need for a screen to separate you from God anymore. Jesus had become that screen. And he said, no one comes to the Father except through me. Go to Jesus and you will enter into the presence of the Holy God. And when Jesus ascended, what did he do? He sent the Holy Spirit. He sent the Holy Spirit onto the church. He sent the Holy Spirit onto every Christian. And Paul says, do you not know that your bodies, your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. Do you get that? You are not your own. You're a temple. You belong to God. Now, that's not how we see it sometimes. I believe this is how we see it often. Our picture is the Holy Spirit comes into us when we give our lives to Jesus. But he comes in a bit like a lodger. He lives inside our body. And we love that relationship because if the Holy Spirit is a lodger, we can lay down the rules. We can say, wipe your feet, shoes off, no loud music, you know, no visitors after 10 o'clock. You don't need a bath once a week. Um, the doors are locked at midnight and make sure you put the toilet seat down. And we want to be able to control the Holy Spirit within us as a lodger or as a tenant. Because we want our Christianity to become neat and orderly. We want to be in control. We don't want the Holy Spirit to start controlling us too much. We don't want him to start moving the furniture around in our house. But that's not how it works. When you become a Christian and the Holy Spirit comes into you, he buys the house. He buys the house. You are the temple. You don't belong to yourself anymore. You belong to God. You are not your own. You become the lodger. You become the tenant. And God becomes the landlord. And he's the king of kings and the landlord of landlords. You know? In verse 16... Jesus called the temple this, my father's house. You are the temple, therefore you are the father's house. His house, he owns you, lock, stock and barrel. Wow, if you're a Christian. So, there's a new notice now that you can have in your temple, which is your body, and this notice is this, everyone is welcome to go beyond the balustrade and the plaza of the temple zone. Whoever is caught doing so will have angels rejoicing in heaven to celebrate the abundant life which will follow. Hey, everything's changed. The court of the Gentiles has to be open to make room for the outsider. Because that was the point of Jesus' anger. For those outside the kingdom of God. For those who want to find the, their way further into the temple, they start in the court of Gentiles. But we want them to pass through into the Israelite court. We want them to pass through into the court of the priests and to discover that Jesus is the great high priest. We want them to pass in to the holy place or to the place of sacrifice to realize that Jesus is the sacrifice for all their sins. And all their sins can be wiped away and they can receive forgiveness. And we want them to pass through, pass through the curtain, which is Jesus again, into the presence of the holy God and to be able to stand up and say, Father. Isn't that what we want for everyone? It's what we have. We want the way to be accessible to everyone. The challenge is to open up the court of the Gentiles in your temple for everyone. 
And I think sometimes we need to free the clutter. Just like Jesus' anger about what was happening at Passover, we need to clear the clutter. We need to provide plenty of room for the outsider to rub shoulders with you in your temple. People who are on a spiritual search, people who want to just understand your faith, why are you a Christian? What does that even mean? They can come into the court of the Gentiles in your temple if it's not cluttered. And we want people to come, don't we? And to stand and gaze in awe at the temple, which is your body. That sounds a bit weird, but you know what I mean. You know what I mean by that. Don't take it the wrong way. The trouble is, often, just like at Passover, in our temple, there's chaos. And there's busyness. And there's stuff that's very, very legit, but it's clogging up the wrong part of the temple. We could be so wrapped up in a wonderful spiritual experience, can't we? And we can spend all our time in the inner part of the temple and ignore the court of the Gentiles where the outsider wants to come. This is, this is the place of meeting. This is where... You meet the person who needs Jesus, and when they meet you, they meet Jesus. This is the place of meeting. We have to open up in every temple in this room. You need to open up. I do as well. Of course, this really challenged me. But life can be full of rituals. Life can be full of very legitimate ministry. Life can be full where there's no space in the diary for the court of the Gentiles to exist where there's no opportunity for friendship to be started with people who need Jesus, where that conversation can't happen. We need to prepare the court of the Gentiles for the outsider. See, all the things that were happening in Jerusalem during that Passover... They were all legitimate. The Holy of Holies wasn't being violated. The Holy Place wasn't being violated. The Hall of the Priests were obeying the laws God had given him. The Hall of Israel was fine. The Court of the Women, everything was fine. It was just the outsider's court that was the problem. There was no room for the outsider. The house of prayer for all people. And we fall into that trap sometimes as well. We need the heart of God for the outsider. And sometimes we have that heart, but we have no space to do anything with it. In 2 Corinthians 2, Paul says this, But thanks be to God, who always leads us triumphantly as captives in Christ, and through us, spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. For we are to God the sweet aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. And to smell that aroma of Christ, people have to get close to you and begin to know you. And we have to make sure that happens. So let's cut to the chase, shall we? What's the way to clear the court of the Gentiles for the outsider? What's the way to make sure hospitality happens, that friendships start, that conversations happen? Well, practically, we have to plan ahead. It's like a lot of things in life. If you don't plan ahead, it never happens. We drift through and it never happens. We have to plan, actually think about it. We have to clear spaces in our diary. We have to deliberately invite people. And we have to be a bit creative. And this is the challenge I throw out today. To me and to all of us. Let's actually plan this in our lives. So that we're not just spending all our time inside the temple. 
but we're actually in the court of the Gentiles, welcoming the outsider so that they too can be led into the temple to meet Jesus. Just want us to have some thinking time. I'm just going to leave a couple of minutes. I want you to think about a person, maybe a couple, maybe a family, who you could actually invite, maybe to, to a meal in your house. I mean, think carefully. When was the last time a non-Christian couple came to your house for a meal? I know some of you do this regularly, so it's, this is not for everyone. But a lot of us, we just forget life drifts on. Let's listen to God and think about who God is placing on our hearts, the heart of God for that outsider. And this may not be something you're planning where you hit them over the head with the Bible. This may just be something that is the start of a conversation, and the start of them looking at you and seeing the temple that you are. Maybe you could play golf with somebody and have a chat. Maybe lunch with somebody at work. Go for a walk. Always good for a chat, a walk. Maybe just invite someone for a coffee. Maybe just visit somebody around the corner from where you live for a chat. Pray for those God encounters that you can't plan for as well. That God will give you the words to say at that time. And that friendships will develop out of nowhere because God has actually planned it himself. So let's just have a time of quiet and see what God, what name God puts on your heart. When I was praying this morning, I had this picture of a swimming pool. And loads and loads of people were having enormous fun in the pool, swimming around, playing with a ball. Some people were jumping in from a diving board. It was really good fun. And then it pulled out the picture, and I noticed there was no one around the pool. I didn't understand why. And it went to the gate. And on the gate, there was a sign that said, no non-Christian is allowed, sorry, no swimmer, no non-swimmer is allowed into this pool. And it was right on the front gate. And God, I felt God say, how are they going to learn to swim? <laughs> and so somebody got out of the pool. They went and unlocked the gate and they let everyone in. And these people were standing around the pool looking and thinking, how on earth do you do that? And then somebody and lots of other people got out and took people into the pool gently and showed them how to swim, showed them how to have fun. And I think that's the picture. That round the swimming pool, that area is the court of the Gentiles where we're just introducing people to our faith in Jesus I was challenged so I I'm going to be playing snooker on Thursday with my neighbor and the other neighbors we've invited around for a meal because unless we do this when God says things drift on we've got time perhaps while we while we worship if you want to turn to the next person next to you maybe and just say uh, this is the name I have. Will you pray? 
for this person and for my interaction with this person. That would be good to do. Um, whoever God has placed on your heart, just mention that name to someone else and let them pray for you. I think let's do that now, Phil. Hmm? I think that's a great idea. Let's do that now. Yeah, let's do that now. Why don't we just turn to the person next to you or people around you if there's, there's no one next to you, there's some threes. And who is it that the Lord's laid on your heart? Maybe they're sitting next to you. That would be a bit awkward, wouldn't it? <laughs> 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 but who is it that the Lord's laid on your heart? And then just let's spend a couple of minutes praying. But do you know what really struck me as well? The zeal for the house of the Lord consumed him. And maybe you want to pray that the zeal, the zeal of the Lord for him to meet with those in your life who don't yet know him would consume you. Yeah. Let's spend a few minutes praying together, church. This is something that is very, very practical that you can do in response to John chapter 2. <laughs> Gasky? Gasky, I know that there are other people here as well. I know that this is your life. I know that. And for, there are others here where this is their ministry. Um, Leslie, Marilyn, Matt, I was praying for you this morning, um, and I saw you throwing a life buoy in to somebody to rescue them out of the waves. And I remember thinking, that's what Gasky does. But then it changed, and I, suddenly the life buoy changed to what I can only describe as a huge, giant jalabi. You know that Indian sweet? And it was like lots and lots of life boys all joined together. And I felt God say, not one at a time. This is not one at a time. Plenty of people can grab hold of this and be saved. Take that away. Thanks, Matt. Why don't we stand, if we're able? Lord, with zeal for your house consumers. Lord, with passion for your name, consume us a desire to see your kingdom come in our lives and through our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very soul. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church. We need your power in us. We seek your kingdom first, we hunger and we thirst, refuse to waste our lives, 
for your our joy and prize to see the captive hearts release the hurt the sick the poor of peace we lay down our lives for heaven's core we are your church we pray revive this earth come on Build your kingdom here, let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand, heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire, win this nation back. Change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here, we pray. Unleash your kingdom's power, reaching the near and far. No force of hell can stop your beauty changing hearts. You made us for much more than this. Awake the kingdom seed in us. Fill us with the strength and love of Christ. We your church we are the hope on earth build your kingdom here let the darkness fear show your mighty hand heal our streets and land set your church on fire win this nation back Change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here, we pray. Build your kingdom, build your kingdom here, shed the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand, heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire, win this nation back, change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here, we pray, we pray, we pray. A phrase that's really popular in new wine is the meeting place, is the training place, the marketplace. So we meet here to be sent out and trained to do ministry wherever we are. And so as you go, as you leave this place, Father, I pray that we will take Jesus with us. You would get rid of the stuff, the clutter that gets in the way of us spending time with those who don't know you yet. That many people will meet Jesus through meeting us. And all God's people said, Amen. Guys, great to be with you today. Have a great week. Enjoy tea and coffee. If you're new, do show yourself to one of us. And we love to chat. Have a great week.